Greetings and salutations, everyone, and welcome to tonight's second half. This puts us that much closer to tonight's live stream, 12 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, Saturday Nightmares, live from New York. I hope to see you all there, but that's not why we're here right now. We are here for tonight's second half and some very terrifying experiences. Before we get into them, though, a couple links. As many of you know, I rely on Patreon, PayPal, channel membership, and the merch to help the channel to continue to grow and go. Links to Patreon, PayPal, and channel membership is in the description below. Merch displayed directly under the video. Also, Dogman Frightening Encounters, Volume 1 through 3, the audiobook versions. They were written and researched by Tom Lyons, narrated and produced by me, Jeff Nadolny. Those audiobooks are available on Audible, Amazon, and iTunes, links to which are also in the description as well. And finally, last but definitely not least, if you'd really like to help support the channel to continue to grow and go, simply subscribe. It doesn't cost you a cent. Click that like button. Takes half a second. If you don't want to miss out on any of the informative uploads I put out daily, click that bell icon and folks, please leave a comment. Why? Well, because all these things really do help the channel to continue to grow and go. And yes, folks, they definitely do matter. Now, everyone, I have taken far too much of your time. Let's jump in to tonight's second half, shall we? Today's first West Virginia subscribers, Dogman submission. Hey Jeff, how are you? I'm a 32 year old lady from the very northern tip of West Virginia. Most of my life has been lived in Hancock County. When I was little, we camped in tents, walked everywhere, hiked at parks. All that outside goodness. In my teens, we started going to state parks to ride horses. I've been to Tomlinson Run, Beaver Creek State Park, Salt Fork, Raccoon Creek, and Vista Park. I think that was the name. We had a friend who was constantly inviting us to ride on people's land she had received permission from. I'm well acquainted with the local wildlife. I've seen all the major players, including koi dog, bear, and can identify most sounds in the forest. I love watching nature documentaries. I was looking to become a vet. So I had studied a lot on animals. Drawing and painting them got me very acquainted with animal anatomy. Was I ever into cryptozoology? Oh yeah. I was a dino crazy little girl. My one babysitter had Reader's Digest, Mysteries of the Unexplained. The thought of a plesiosaur in Scotland or an Aptosaurus in the Congo was just mind-blowing. Later in life, I started looking at the folklore. It was interesting to read the accounts and learn the theories behind what people were seeing. But I believed in them as much as a folklorist believes in dragons and trolls. I didn't have any interest in Bigfoot, and I had never heard of Dogman. I never had interest in looking, nor did the thoughts ever cross my mind. It seems I didn't need to go looking. They found me. We moved to the farm when I was about 10 years old. Mom's dream was to have horses, and she was finally able to live it. The farmhouse was haunted, mainly by a former resident of the home. I never felt threatened by them, though. It's a little unnerving to have two men talking and moving the couch you're sitting on, or should I say it sounded like it. No one was home, no media was on, and yet I was hearing two men talking about how they were going to move the couch and where, and the sound of furniture being dragged right from under me. The land itself had its fair share of strangeness as well. Most things were benign, though. We just shrugged it off and carried on. I honestly hated our woods. Anywhere else, I'd freely hike. But even in the yard, sometimes I felt watched. Heck, sometimes I thought something was staring in our windows. Now that I think of it, we did have things slam into our trailer. I'd think it was a horse that had gotten loose, but when I'd go outside to investigate, I'd find nothing. I'd just chalk it up to a deer. 
I used my horses' breeds for their names rather than thick up names for them. Anyone who knows me knew my horses' names. I was 18 to 19 in this encounter. By this time, we had given up on cows. God, I hate cows. And just had horses and chickens. Someone knocked on the door at 2 in the morning. I'd only been asleep for a couple hours, but years of conditioning had my heart pumping and my mind clearing. Someone knocking that early meant trouble. It usually meant horses or livestock had gotten out. I wasn't disappointed. Our neighbor said the horses were in his yard. My mind wasn't totally awake, so I didn't think to ask which yard they were in. My stepfather came out, asked what was up, and told me they were my horses, so deal with it. My mom was working. That was nothing new. This lot of horses had three expert escape artists. I had the routine down. It was pretty dark out, but I did have some moonlight to help. The security light only went so far, then of course it shut off after so long. When it's cloudy, you literally have to watch that you didn't walk off into a ravine. It was so pitch. I'm naturally in a foul mood, cursing my horses and wondering if some drunk had gotten through the fence again. It's happened a lot. As I got closer to the brown barn, I realized a horse was flipping out. It was running back and forth, squealing and carrying on. I went in and grabbed the halters and leads. I paused for a moment to see if any other horses had replied to this horse in her squeals. That would give me an idea of where the other horse or horses may be. There was no reply, and that was odd. I was thinking, crap, they're on the other side of the hill. It was the only reason in my mind they weren't replying. Let's just say when they followed our cut trails to the other side, it took us an hour to traverse through the woods and lead them back. And even with two guys on four-wheelers and my mom, that was a freaky trek. I felt like I was being watched and followed. Maybe it was my paranoia. So the land is set up like this. The brown barn was connected to a small pasture, about a half an acre long, which then connects to a seven acre pasture, pretty sure, pretty much in the center. On the outside edge of the large pasture was an old white barn that we had turned into a run-in. I decided to tackle the horses still in the fence so I could bring her down to the small pasture to keep her from escaping as well. Maybe the others would follow. I had to walk clear to the other side of the pasture to get the panicking horse. It's my mom's psycho, a Palooza mare. I tried to catch her, and nearly. Got trampled a few times trying. She was frothing at the mouth. Her eye whites were really showing. Was I alarmed? Nope. As I said, psycho. I noticed my other six were across the road. They were standing in a tiny little fenced-in area under the spotlight. They were standing motionless and not touching a blade of grass. I was wondering how the neighbor managed to herd them into that tiny fenced-in area with that tiny door. Three of the horses were over 16 hands tall. One was a draft cross. The doorway was actually small enough he touched both sides going through. My thoroughbred mare took me two hours to corral the last time. She got out, much to my frustration. She's an awesome jumper. So, a stranger rounding them up and putting them into a tiny yard is just mind-blowing. I've had horses since I was nine. I'm 32 now. I've had ponies, horses... I've had Appaloosas, Arabians, draft horses, quarter horses, walking horses, saddlebreds, thoroughbreds, mustangs, foals, geldings, mares, and geldings that still thought they were stallions. I've had a lot of horses from all walks of life. I will tell you, they consistently do not like to be crammed into tight spaces, especially not in a group. I had two severely abused horses I was rehabbing, a thoroughbred that actually had PTSD, and a raking horse that actually took me three years to touch without some sort of bad reaction. They did not like being in stalls, and all but one were mares. Mares are extremely moody, and two of mine were particularly vicious to those they did not like. 
My walker mare only liked three other horses. She should have been kicking the crap out of the others there. Mine also didn't like to be under lights when they escaped. They avoided them like the plague and their nut-eating grass that was over ankle deep. That was unheard of. They were silent and dead still. My neighbor came out and told me that they were like that when he found them. He asked me if I needed help, and I said no. My thoroughbred and racking horse mare didn't like men. I told him I'd take them out one at a time. I took one halter in the lead and threw the rest outside the gate. I put the halter on my gelding and opened the gate to lead them out. They all had other plans, though. All six came out as a friggin' unit. They were literally chest to butt crammed together. My gelding and my Welsh mare had their chest pushing against me as we walked back to the brown barn. Normally, they did not do this. I wouldn't usually allow such bad behavior as well. We were on the main road, which I did not like. The speed limit is only 35, but people go 60, so I tried to lead them through the large pasture gate. They wouldn't even go on that side of the road. I was a little unnerved by their behavior, so I led them down to the brown barn and they went in. They were skittish, though, picking at the hay I threw out, walking around restlessly, sticking to the barn like glue, and eyeing the upper pasture. I rationalize it by thinking it's the appy flipping out that's unnerving them and why hadn't she come down yet she had to have seen us walk down i rushed to the gate between the little and the big pastures out of habit i didn't want the herd to go back out into the big pasture i didn't have to worry they didn't follow me like they normally did the gate was wide open and the appy was still running and squealing back and forth in the same area i started to go get her now, the neighbor's security lights didn't really light up my pasture. The road was higher than my pasture, so it cast in a shadow. I could make out her shape and some detail, though. She took off at a panicked gallop, swerved sideways, jumped the stream. When she landed, she nearly landed on her face. She caught herself, though, and took off at a dead gallop again. I ducked behind a stump. If she would have hit me, I would have been dead. I went back and chained the gate and I decided to forego looking her over until I got the halters and leads. She was too hot at the moment. I decided to walk on the road instead of through the pasture again. The pasture was uneven, unlit, and full of springs. Sometime during this, clouds had taken over the sky so there was no moonlight to see now. The spot on the road where I was at was paved and pretty well lit, though my neighbor was paranoid as mentioned. I had almost gotten to the white barn when I got this sudden urge to stop and look at the very specific spot in the pasture, I'd like to say. It was instinct that told me to look, but usually I'd scan the woods first to see what was watching me. That's usually where the watchers are. Instead, I just flicked on my flashlight right on a certain spot. It was extremely close to where my mare was flipping out. I saw a red eye shine. My first thought was, why in the world would a deer be here with all this chaos? I was feeling a sense of extreme dread, and I didn't know why. Besides, it being where my horse was going nuts told me something else wasn't right. I then realized where the eyes were relative to the walnut trees and my racing barrels. See, the road is above the pasture and the walnut trees were right at the same elevation as the road. The pasture itself is sloped. To deal with the runoff from the road, the barrel it is next to was on the low end of the incline. The barrels were white, so I could see them in dim lighting from my flashlight. On the one it was next to, this thing was too freaking big to be a deer. It was frozen, standing there watching it. I just had this feeling it was evil, and that I had to keep track of those eyes. It was watching me. It slowly blinked a few times. It also looked over into the woods above the pasture. I know you ask your guests if they'd ever feel there are others out there. Well, let me tell you. 
It crossed my mind. With a sinking stomach, I flashed my flashlight over the woods to see if I would catch some eye shine. I didn't see any, though. So, I went right back to those eyes. They were still there. I flicked back and forth, making sure nothing was sneaking up on me. I don't know how long I stood there, watching, frozen. Someone could have come around that bend and hit me with their car. I was so focused. Finally, it started to move off. It glanced at me sideways a few times. I think it went into the copse of tree around the creek. I heard nothing. That wasn't surprising, though. The horses were still restless and making noise. I stood there a long time after, looking for the eye shine. I was wondering if it could have been a bear. I didn't think so, though. The eyes were consistent in height until it disappeared. Bears are clumsy on their back legs. On this uneven, inclined ground, I have no doubt a bear would have dropped to the ground to go on all fours. Even the rear up and down behavioured bears do when they are trying to see something wouldn't work. We had one cross the pasture before and he made a lot of noise going through the woods. The horses settled down quicker with the bear. I was almost to my neighbors at this point. I considered leaving the couple hundred dollars of tack at their house. Halters and leads aren't cheap. I had no doubt if I left them there they'd be gone in the morning and my mom would be pissed. So I darted over, grabbed them, and ran like a bat out of hell. I know, I know. I should have left the tack. I also know you're not supposed to run, but I couldn't even conceive what I had just seen. I got into the barn, threw the tack down, hung with the horses. I wasn't going back up that pitch black driveway on foot. I figured with the horses, I'd have a warning. And the barn had plenty of sharp things. I did not go back up until dawn. I was frozen stiff by that time. I've had years to think this over. It unnerves the crap out of me. How long was that thing there? Was that what was keeping the appy mare from coming down? Was it right there in the shadows while I was trying to catch her? Or was it in the unlit barn I had walked through to get to the road? Was it the reason the appy swerved and nearly fell? How did my horses get out? I never did find out how they got out. Did they panic and jump the fence? I did check the fence line away from the woods. I did look for tracks around the barrel. Sadly, the ground was hard from frost that morning, but I will say the Appy Mayor was running for a good while. The ground was severely torn up and turned into a muddy mess. It was high noon when I went down there to check. The ground had melted. I'd bet it was her that woke the neighbor up. It took them about a week to fully settle. I don't know if whatever it was was still in the area or if they were that traumatized. It wasn't too long after that my mother filed for divorce. My ex-stepfather got the farm and I moved in with her in the city. Even with all the weird crap going on there, there were no bipedal things going on out there. I miss it terribly. Maybe it's more accurate to say I miss the farm life rather than the actual place. I'd love to go back onto that farm again, but I'd probably hesitate to move back there. Jeff, I've never told anyone about the eye shine event. I didn't see the actual creature, and really, how do you convey that unnatural horror-inducing feeling you saw eye shine? whoop de doo My mother would have given me the benefit of the doubt, but my mother often told family members things. They made my life enough of a living hell, and I didn't want to give them any more ammo. Alright Jeff, the first order of weirdness. All the barn cats disappeared. People were constantly dumping them, and we had one hell of a population, and poof, gone. The neighbors asked us about it. I told them we had assumed they had gotten sick of them and took them to the pound. They thought we might have poisoned them. We decided maybe the foxes had ate them, even though the fox never bothered them before, except the fox family disappeared as well. No signs of them. The den they used for decades, falling in. Even my house cat disappeared. She liked lying on the porch. I once found a kitten with its face bitten off. 
Like, laser cut, no bone crushing, creeped the hell out of me. Second major event was similar to the one mentioned prior, except the majority of horses came up to our house. I walked them to the brown barn, locked them in the lower pasture. That time, I was the thoroughbred that was stuck in the upper, upper pasture. The thoroughbred didn't need much encouraging to come down as the appy, but I still was worried she was going to snap something running in the dark like a bat out of hell. I just dismissed it as dumb horses. They ran through fences that time, ripped them down. Never did it before, didn't do it after. Even when we had an actual black bear go through the pasture. I was checking the fence line about a week later. I found a deer in the far corner dead. No obvious reason for death. Figured it got hit by a car. Couldn't make it over to the fence and died right there. Except it seemed every week another was piled on top of it. Like literally piled on top. Nothing scavenged them. Just bacteria and bugs eating them. Six ended up in the pile. We decided we were going to bury them health hazard, and all gone when we got to the tractor out there. You could see where they had been, dead grass and body juices, but that was it. I also noticed the horses no longer went back there. They loved that area, heavily shaded to keep cool and bugs off, nice spring, apple and trees, but no fresh tracks in the mud and the horses wouldn't follow me into the area. At least, not until a month or two after the corpses disappeared. Then there was the event mentioned. Makes me wonder if it had been feasting on the cats. No more cats, so they decided to go into bigger prey. It creeps me out, thinking that it could have been inches from me in the pitch black barn or field. I was totally focused on my horses, not on cryptids lurking in the dark. I noticed one person asked if the neighbor put the horses in the fence. No, he did not. As I mentioned, two of the horses were terrified of men. Those two were also terrified of stalls. I had six horses in the fenced-in yard, barely big enough to hold them. They were literally touching the fence. They were so crammed in. The gate opening they had walked through, my draft geldings, shoulder, shoved the poles out towards when he walked through the fence. They were very narrow. As for getting out, I can only guess they were so terrified they decided jumping was the only way to safety. They had to have jumped uphill to get out. I still baffle at my draft in Welsh mare. She's 30 years old making that jump. No fencing down. I'm guessing any tracks inside the pasture were destroyed by the panicking Appy and the ground outside. It was hard-packed road dirt and road. Something was also killing the dogs. Ripping them to shreds. My best friend's American Eskimo was ripped apart right outside her bedroom. They heard nothing. She lived across the street from the farm. A huge German Shepherd in a six-foot fence was also ripped apart without the owners hearing a thing. Koi dogs could have gotten the Eskimo as it was on a chain, but the Shepherd... I can't see a pack of coyotes all climbing that fence and attacking that dog. One would have not been able to take him down. There were much more incidences. Didn't know the people, though. I don't remember how long after the eyeshine incident, my paint mare came trotting up with a weird injury. It was like someone took an ice cream scoop to her shoulder, like someone took it from the top of her shoulder blade and scooped it down to the mid-shoulder. The flesh was just bobbed as she walked, not jagged. If the wound was done on the opposite direction, I could think of lots of ways, but this was odd. And just so clean, not sure if it's related, but man, all this weird crap together. Might as well mention it. We had three pastures to prevent pasture fatigue. One being above our house. I only had three horses then. The walking mare, the draft gelding, and the racking horse. Well, 
they started raising hell around 10 p.m. I got up there to see what was going on. I found my walking mare on the ground, barbed wire wrapped around her legs. Draft gelding standing over, racking horse, nowhere to be seen. I left them, went down to get bolt cutters for my mom. My draft and the walker were awesome horses. The mare just lied there while I cut the wire off. All the while, something big was pacing quadruped back and forth in the woods behind us. It stayed just out of the light and there was no eye shine. I assumed it was the racking horse, impatient. Her herd wasn't with her. I was MF in that mare as she was constantly getting out that fence, but I was focused on the downed mare. Racking horse was not my immediate concern. So I led the two horses down. I had all my medical supplies down there, and now the upper pasture fence was compromised. I was expecting the racking horse to follow. It did, but never left the woods. I kept shining my flashlight up, calling her to come down. No sound, no eye shine, nothing. Just heavy body moving through the woods parallel to us. We got to the barn. And there was the racking horse, major WTF moment. She had been there the whole time. With the damage she had done to the hay bales and the poop on the floor, there was no way the thing following us in the woods was her. She'd have to run out in front of us and cross our path. She was a pinto, lots of white. And there was a security light, no missing her. Deer, well, if it was deer, that was one hell of a deer. I've been stalked by deer plenty of times. This thing was big, heavy enough for my mom and I to think it was the mayor. It didn't make the normal snorting, stomping a deer does. I guess it could have been a bear. I did go up and fix the fence. I looked for tracks. I found the racking mare's tracks, followed the cleared fence line down to the road. I tried getting deeper to see if I could figure out what was pacing back and forth up there. The brush was mostly multi-form roses, and I couldn't get very deep. I wasn't willing to go deep as I could, couldn't see very far. The final event a month before my mom dropped the divorce news. I was 27, 28 at the time. My cousin and I decided to go for a ride. She caught up in something, arrived late. It was dusk, but it had been too hot to ride as of late. The day was cooler, so we decided, screw it, we're going. Both horses were very experienced in dusk and night rides, bomb-proof, super-experienced horses. This was their home turf. No worries, right? So, we get to the trailhead. They spook hard at a cat and land on my feet. Cousin wasn't so lucky. Figure they're just getting their oats from not being ridden. I was in the lead. We get halfway through the trail ride to a tricky hill. A spring runs down it. The ground is clay. It can be slick as hell. I'm keeping an eye on any branches and such my gelding could trip on. I hear my mare squeal, my cousin yell, and the sound of hooves hitting flesh. I look back and see my cousin still on the mare's back. But my gelding, he's not having it. Full out gallop. He lets me steer a bit, but no slowing down or stomping, stopping for his steed. They don't stop until they're at the house. Even then, they're hyped as hell, wild-eyed and frothing. It's totally out of character for both horses. I had a dog attack us on the trail once, ripped my gelding's leg up pretty bad, and he still wasn't this freaked out. We dismount and walk them to the barn letting them calm down a bit. Do a once over, make sure they're okay. I'm asking, what about, what did she kick? My cousin explained that something had slammed into the ass end of her, shoving them over. Mayor got her footing and bucked, kicked. She didn't see what. She was just trying to stay on. She was a beginner. We were boxed in with a tall brush on both sides, so No way to see what was coming. Kicker was, a few inches from her spine on her hindquarters, was a line of hair bunched up with spit, like when horses bite each other. Why couldn't it have been that? Well, my cousin had brushed her with every brush I owned. 
That mare was shining before we started a ride, and it was fresh wet. I brushed it down and inspected her. I didn't see a broken bone. Let me tell you, it takes a lot to knock down a horse. Horses play and quarrel rough. I don't think a deer running full speed could have hit her that hard. Something at least five to six foot tall nipped that mare. In the hind end, got a solid kick for the trouble. Trust me, hooves hitting flesh makes a totally different sound than wood and stone. Did I go up to investigate? Hell no. After the eye shine incident, then this? No way in hell was I going up there. I can't help but think the two horses knew what was up there, and that's why they were acting so weird. These two had been all through the above-mentioned incidents. If they could talk, I can't imagine the stories they'd tell. My mom also told me about an incident she had. She was driving to work around 6 p.m. in the fall. She had gotten past Mountaineer Racetrack. It was pitch black, deer were running, so she's keeping an eye out for eye shine and movement. She caught something from the corner of her eye, figuring it was a deer, except it was red like a deer in the spring. Deer go grayish brown in the winter area. And it was fast as hell. It was no deer, but some kind of canid. She was in a Subaru Outback, and she said that the head and shoulders were quite a bit higher than her hood. Looked like a huge coyote or wolf, except the color and size. She had no clue how she didn't hit it. But it wasn't moving fast enough. She didn't turn her head quick enough either to see it disappear into the dark. I can't help but notice that these events always happen in late summer to late winter. I did look for odd tracks like Bigfoot. I will admit, I looked for oversized cloven hooves after the eye shine incident. Just the level of terror and evil I got from that thing, but never thought to look for oversized dog tracks. Hindsight, you know. In the last year, I've made amends with my stepdad. I go there for Sunday dinner. Bigfoot could walk in the front door and he wouldn't notice. So no clue if things are still happening. The cat population never recovered. But I do know when dinner is done, I book it for the car. Even though the old white barn has been torn down. The security lights can't reach further into the pasture. I don't like looking out there anymore. Tonight's final West Virginia subscriber submission. Hey Jeff, my first experience happened around 1986 to 87. I was young, but I remember it well. It was a clear summer day. I was just doing what most youths do playing and not having a care in the world. We used to have three dogs at the time, a shepherd mixed named Doggy Dog, a terrier named Buster, looked almost exactly like Benji from the old movies, and a short-haired collie named Trixie. They were some of the best companions a kid could have. Now, Trixie was very energetic, protective of our house. The other two were strays that my parents took in. Trixie was acquired as a pup from the cellar. Our house was on the outskirts of town, surrounded by 25 acres of wooded land. I used to run those woods a lot, build forts, hide-and-go-seek, etc. Always had the feeling like I was being watched, you know, feeling like you're not alone. Well, my mom usually let the dogs out several times a day to do their business. On this one day, only Trixie went out. We had a small fenced-in area right at the back door off our breezeway. There was a huge walnut tree at the far corner of the fence just inside of it. So when mom opened the door, Trixie flew out. The other two stayed put in the living room. After a little coaxing, mom just figured they didn't have to go. No more than five minutes went by when mom went to let her back in. Well, Trixie was gone. And by gone, I mean vanished without a trace, like a fart in the wind. Now, she was around six and would always come back when let inside the fence, but... This time, she was in the fenced-in part. Only thing we found was a couple of tufts of black fur on the fence, and Dad seemed to think that he had seen a small drag mark in front of the tree. We offered a $100 reward at first, which went up to $300 a week later. We searched the woods, farms nearby, basically all directions around our little town. No trace, no leads, nothing. 
As the years have gone by and I've come to educate myself in the cryptid field, I've really leaned towards Dogman as the culprit. It was either hiding up in the walnut tree or in the wood line, which was about 12 feet or so from the fence. As listeners, you can't be, ju be the judge. There was no holes under the fence, and the gates were locked. Something came over that fence and snatched her. Oh, I forgot to mention, the fence was a wired type of fence, sort of like a chain link, but in a square pattern. The top first row of squares were bent inward. Mom, till the day she died, always believed she was snatched by a person. It wasn't a person. Well, that's my first encounter. I'll be sending you one more. Thanks for listening, Jeff. Same sub, final email. Hey, Jeff, it was the summer of 92. I was staying with a friend. He lived at the beginning of a dead-end road. We used to ride our bikes a lot. We'd ride down the dead end and back. At the end of the road was an entrance to a large cornfield, and on the right was a wooded area. He had a big knife collection, everything from your basic pen knife to small swords and throwing axes. We'd load our pockets with them and strap a sword or two on our backs and bungee an axe and machete to our bikes and take off. We liked heading into the cornfield and chopping our way through the stalks. It was fun. Thinking back, I'm glad we were never wrecked. That would have been pr plenty awful. Anyway, we got the bright idea to explore the section of woods on the right. It was pretty thick in there. We hacked our way in. It was bigger than what we thought. After a bunch of hacking and chopping, we came to a small clearing in an old house. No front door. Windows were gone. It was basically rotten away. Been abandoned for quite some time. It was weird, though. Out front, there were kids' toys. We found two power wheels, a Fisher-Price kitchen playhouse, a basketball, which they didn't look like they'd been there long. As the house looked abandoned, upon entering the front door, it looked like a bird's nest. There were sticks and old rotten branches twisted up. And there was a lot of old walnut shells and acorns lying around. The second floor was rotted away in a circle. Walking up to the second floor, the two rooms were off either side, seemed to be intact and empty. Couldn't get over the room on the left because of the big hole. Didn't stay in there too long because it was clearly not safe. We goofed around for a little while, checking things out. Couldn't figure out why all the kid toys were there. There was two small game trails leading off towards the fields, too. We noticed it had gotten quiet, no bugs or birds, only us and our thoughts. So we decided to get out of there. We had pretty much made it to our bikes when we heard this loud crash off to the right and kind of behind us. The weeds were about up to our waist where we were standing. About 10 yards from the edge of the road to our bikes, we quickly darted out and snatched our bikes up looking back before we jumped on. Best way to describe is there's a clip on YouTube from a rocking hounding with Bigfoot called Bluff Charge. The weeds and the trees were shaking, and just a, when it was about to pop out of the tall weeds, it stopped. It was wondering why we didn't get whiplash from how quick our heads kept turning around. We jumped on our bikes and we were gone, pedaling as hard and as fast as we could. Needless to say, we never rode past that house again. I'll never forget the fear we both had that day. All right, folks, I hope you all enjoyed tonight's second half as much as I enjoyed sharing it with you. I'd like to thank you all for supporting this channel. It is, after all, your support that keeps this channel growing and going. And also, what gives people a place to share their experiences, ideas, and theories with no ridicule, no judgment, just 100% respect. Thank you. Stay safe, happy, healthy, and ever vigilant, keeping an eye on our children, pets, family, and friends. These creatures are real. They are out there, and they are dangerous. Share this information with the people you love and care about, and it may just help save their lives someday. Until next time, never stop asking questions, never stop searching for the answers, and God bless.